what business are we in? What right do we have as a brand or, or as an organization to be in that business? And what are the proof points that we need to put out there as a either as a brand or as a system in the case of Massage Envy or even a Batteries Plus that we are the right, we have the right to be there and you can believe in us as, as part of that journey. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. As your marketing career progresses, you will go through many transitions, or perhaps you have already. I know for me, it was starting in B2C, then moving to B2B. It was from luxury real estate to software to marketing, from ads in the newspaper to digital, from advertising copywriting to content marketing, from the FM radio to what you're listening to now, podcasting. So many transitions. Well, my guest on this episode has a great story of a fundamental lesson he learned in the transition from consumer packaged goods to a business with a franchise model that can, and you can apply that to any transition a marketer makes, really. Understand the economics of the business. So true. That's just one of the many lesson filled stories we'll hear from Derek Detember, the Chief Marketing and Merchandising Officer at Batteries Plus. Thanks for being here, Derek. Hey, thanks for having me. That's great. So I'm just going to quickly. Go down your LinkedIn. I cherry-picked a few of your experiences so people understand who we're talking to. Uh, Started out senior client representative at IBM, and then you moved over to the B2C side, senior marketing manager at PepsiCo for its Gatorade and Propel Fitness water brands at different times, Uh, director of marketing uh, for EAS and Zone Perfect Business at Abbott Laboratories, uh, vice president of brand management at Wendy's, senior vice president of marketing at Massage Envy, and right now, Chief Marketing and Merchandising Officer at Batteries Plus. Maybe we can call it CMMO. So what's that? What's that extra M in there for? And CMMO. What's that extra M in there for? And and tell us about your current role. Yeah, you know, it's it's, as I go through my career, I'm just trying to add letters to it. No, it's um, (laughs) Chief Chief Marketing and Merchandising Officer. So at at Batteries Plus, we are a 700 unit franchise business, uh, retail business, and obviously as part of retail. The product assortment and how it's merchandised in store is as important as how we generate demand through marketing. So my two groups are the category management merchandising group and and then the marketing communications group. Okay, great. So let's start by looking at some of the things you made in your marketing career. Like I said, I haven't been anything else, but I think, you know, great thing about marketers is we make things, right? We walk away and we make things. You could walk out of that store and, you know, like I affected how everything looks in that store. You know, I don't know, accountants or pension managers, I don't know. They don't really make things in my mind, but we make things. So let's look at some of the things you made. So the first lesson you learn, you say a quality product isn't enough. You need to craft experiences. So it sounds, sounds like a true maker. So tell us about your approach and, and how you've done that in your career. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's something that I've kind of learned and, and built throughout my career from a, an experience standpoint. You know, it really started with the Gatorade business. It was a very experiential business um, from the way that we marketed the product to the orange coolers on the sidelines, you know, sponsoring youth sports events and, and things. So we wanted to get athletes involved in the brand uh, very early. Uh, and and that obviously translated into a very good business as Things have changed in the world of marketing, Uh, as you mentioned in your your intro, going from newspaper to digital and things like that. um, The 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 experience, the nature of experience has changed over time. And so, in my most recent experience, uh, I was the chief marketing officer at Artisanal Brewing Ventures. We were uh, a group that bought and operated craft breweries, distilleries, and cideries. And you know, while we'd love to think that our liquids were the best liquids, uh, you know, on the planet, you know the marginal difference between this beer and that beer and that spirit and this spirit are, are, are relatively small. And so you're really trying to market on the nature of the brand and how you can create a story and experience behind that brand. So as part of that business, we operated 16 tap rooms and that way we could get consumers to come in, try the product, 
We treat them like they are our guests in, in our home, and hopefully they leave uh, not only liking the product, but being an ambassador of the brand. And so by creating good, high-quality products, that was table stakes. Everybody basically in, in the craft industry today um, creates good products, some better than other, but but they're, they're good. It wasn't it's not, Today is not like the beginning of craft beer where you could pull something off the shelf and you're like, ooh, this isn't very good. Uh, most of the products are very good, and so you have to kind of take it to the next level of – how do we create a better experience, a better story uh, for consumers to really love your brand? Yeah, I love that. You've got this three box approach that you use. Can you can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, this goes back to kind of really learning how to do advertising. I, I, I credit Cindy Alston and Marie Devlin for for teaching me the three box system that that we that we used at Gatorade. It was a really a three tiered advertising approach, and, and this was back in when TV was sort of the, the master channel that that we marketed in. And, you know, the bottom box, we called it, um, was really about efficacy. It was about um, how that this product works. And you would see ads that talking about the science and mnemonic devices of Gatorade going into the body and rehydrating um, people. And, and then you'd see the middle box, uh, which is really how Gatorade fit into people's lives. So this is where, you know, you used everyday athletes, you know, high school athletes, college athletes, and showed them doing their thing. And then, you know, how Gatorade then kind of played into their uh, rehydration or recovery uh, types of occasions. And then the top box was really kind of the glitz and glamour of sport. Um, it's where we use professional athletes, Peyton Man and Derek Jeter, you know, Dick Dwayne Wade, Tiger Woods at, at some point, and so on. And um, that really tried in those in those ads, they were they were the big ads. They were the ones that everybody really, you know, liked working on and wanted to see. And it really put Gatorade in the context of you know, big sport, big events on the sidelines, on the on court side. But you know what? When it really came down to it, um, what was interesting about those boxes? We could we could play with the levers in any given year or quarter based on a media plan, and you know, flex on more top box ads or more middle box ads or more bottom box ads. But every time we did a media mix analysis, the ads that really drove the business were the bottom box, and that's kind of how we came up with this box structure. It's almost like a pyramid. Um, you know, knowing that, that, that this stuff that you're putting in your body works better than water um, for those rehydration occasions is what really the business was built on. And, and as much as we like those top box ads, and we use them and we use them effectively, um, the bottom box uh, really was, was what we had to, to do to seed this product in people's minds and, and get them to choose this over water. You know, that's great. And if you're listening and you're a B2B marketer, right? So, you know, Derek's talking about his experience with Gatorade, with artisanal brewing. So I found a, uh, some data we published that is, uh, you know, kind of perfect and explains why B2Bs can help with this too. We published data from Elastic Path that showed 54% of B2B C-suite leaders felt they had lost customers due to a poor quality commerce experience. So that experience is so key to it. And when I hear what you're saying, I also think of it's similar to when I worked in the software field, right? So one box, there is a technical that you need to talk about, about the software and actually how it works, of course. You know, the, the, that other box is, okay, there's different roles within an organization. There's the business level. There's the technical level. There's even the partner level. You have to communicate, okay, how does it fit in your specific role? And then kind of the flashly, f- flashy athlete box, you know, there's obviously, there's the the big events. There's even, you know, TV advertising. I remember I think it was EDS who did that Super Bowl ad about herding cats. So I think whatever, uh, you know, kind of company you're working for, you can really understand that this can apply to you. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to bring up is that that customer experience part you talked about, like with artisanal brewing, because I see this is growing more and more, especially uh, in a post-COVID age where we're interested in the in-person experience. So experience I had is, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, if you ever go to Starbucks, I would go to Starbucks, you know, a few years ago, and it was a nice experience. I would go, I'd buy a newspaper, I'd read the newspaper there, you know, sometimes I'd bring my kids on the weekend, I'd bring a game of checkers, a game of chess, and we'd hang out there. It was that kind of third place. And then something I noticed before COVID and then during, like, you know, they like stopped selling the newspaper and then, you know, during COVID. And now what I do, I got, you know, Starbucks yesterday morning, you go on the app, you walk and you get, you get it from the drive through and there's no relationship with the, the barista anymore. And something I've noticed is, you know, they're bringing Howard Schultz back. And one of the things I think he's trying to drive home again is, to your point, like with the, with the beer, it's, 
it's expensive brown water. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Without that experience, it's expensive brown water. So anyone who's got a chance to touch a customer, even e-commerce companies, you know, we're, we've seen this with Warby Parker, with Untucked, with so many companies that were e-commerce and didn't have that physical experience with customers. They're trying to bring that back. And I'm guessing that's kind of a way that Batteries Plus 2 competes with some of the e-commerce vendors out there, right? I know like when I've gotten into one, it's like you, you get more of a technical expertise there versus just, hey, I'm searching three different websites and, and I hope this works out. Yeah, you know, the Batteries Plus model is, is very interesting because it's an e-commerce business per se, but in, in, it acts on, at least online, it acts a little bit more like a B2B business because most of the products or many of the products that we sell, we can't ship um, due to due to the nature of a battery or you know a lithium battery and things like that, so we want people to shop. We want to convey you know what what we feel is the the difference in the brand, which is the expertise that we know what battery is used for which application that you're in need of at that moment in time, and then ultimately we need to get people to move to the store to actually pick up and, and close that deal. So the online experience has to be. Um, extremely streamlined in the sense that I don't want to go there and look at it like Amazon. We sell black boxes. Everything looks the same um, in terms of a battery. So I don't want to go there and see a list of 25 batteries and and then ultimately put the onus back on the the consumer to choose. I want to go there and say, I have this issue with this car make model or this motorcycle or this boat, and this is the battery that you need to have. And it's available in this location that is close to you. And if it's not available, this is the perfect substitution for it. So we've got to be able to convey that expertise um, more so than just display products uh, in an e-commerce setting. And I think that ties well into our, our next lesson. So, you know, one challenge of definitely seeing my marketing career, sometimes people come in. It's like that old saying that generals say, like, you're always fighting the last war. And sometimes when people come into an organization, they're like, oh, this worked for me before. Let me just try to stick it into this box and, and see what works. So I think your, your lesson is understanding the economics of the business. I can see how that helped you go into Batteries Plus. They have a very unique model. Tell us a story about when you went from a consumer packaged goods brand to a franchise brand and how you learned you really had to understand the economics of that business. Yeah, you know, so the, for the, as you mentioned, the first part of my career, I'm, I'm selling Gatorade, I'm selling water, I'm selling, you know, protein drinks and nutrition bars. These things, you know, our, our fight, so to speak, would be with the operations side of the business, making sure that, you know, we had the right assortment, we had the right SKUs, limiting the SKUs to the ones that are most effective to produce. But ultimately, once we made the decision to produce a product, whatever it was, operators produced it, we shipped it to a retailer, found a spot on the shelf and you know, the margin structure of all of those steps in the process were, were easy to understand. Um, you move into a franchise business and specifically a retail franchise business or a quick serve restaurant franchise business. And every decision that you're making from a marketing standpoint, whether it's a promotion, price, a price promotion, a new menu item, um, it has an impact at the store level. It either creates a good experience or potentially a friction type of experience with the person, um, at the register, or if it's more of a a menu item, there are things that have to happen in the kitchen that are unique and different um, based on that menu item. It could require equipment, it could require space, it could require training, it could require additional ingredients that don't have, you know, high utility or or, or high velocity through the, through the kitchen. And so, you know, when I came into that world, it's like, man, if I want to do something, I've got to really understand all of the impacts that it, that it has and I had a couple franchisees, you know, remind me of that fact or t- try to teach me that, that, that fact. And it, you, you, you learn it pretty quick if you spend some time, you know, in the restaurants or, you know, it, you know in a store, in this case with Batteries Plus, my, my new job. But, it, you know, it's, it's a very different type of mindset versus creating something, put it in a package and ship it out. It's how does this work? How can we deliver it? with quality and with consistency, you know, across, you know, at the time, 6,000 restaurants, uh, you know, in, in the Wendy system. So it was just a very different way to look at the economics. You had to really understand the P&L of the business, um, not just the P&L of the franchisor, who I was employed by, but the, the P&L at the unit level. What, what impacts do you have on labor? What impacts do you have on even things like smallwares, forks, spoons, mixing, mixing equipment, um, you know, food waste? You have to understand all of those things. So it was just a very different uh, P&L uh, mindset that you had to have as a marketer, which was a great experience and, and ultimately, ultimately a, a great tool to have you know, through the rest of my career. 
And I assume it's also kind of a lesson in understand who your customers are, right? So in your case, not just the end customer as a franchisor, the franchisees are your customers as well. Did you, you mentioned the restaurant, did you actually go into the restaurants? So like, how did you try to kind of get to know that customer better, the franchisee customer better? Yeah, you know, it was something that uh, Wendy's did a great job of. You know, you spent your first couple of weeks, you know, working the lines. You were in, you worked the different positions uh, um, in the restaurant, and you know, you made sandwiches. And uh, it was it was a really, you know, it, it was uh, in two ways. It was a great experience. It was a great learning experience of how things worked and how things operated and how uh, precise uh, you had to be in the kitchen to make it, uh, take an order, make it accurately and get it out the door at the speed that we wanted to get it out the door. But it was also a good experience in the sense that it gave you an appreciation, you know, for the, the staff of all these franchise owners that are, that are working, you know, day in and day out trying to deliver the product. And you could be the best marketer in the world and have the best ideas and the best ad campaign and the best menu. But if it can't be executed consistently across the system, it's going to flop. Yeah, so we talk a lot about creativity on this podcast, and true creativity is not creativity that's boundless, right? True creativity is really understanding the limits and the structures within which that creativity has to operate and creating something that works. And really, it also gets me thinking of, you know, understanding the economics of the business. As marketers, it's also good to know where and how the money is made. What are the margins of the products? What is the business model? Is this a loss leader? What is the cost of acquisition per customer? Because we could have a seemingly successful marketing campaign or seemingly successful short-term marketing results and realize that we're, you know, maybe due to our incentives or promotions, we're losing money on the products and, and we're not, you know, keeping customers. So there's not a lifetime value there. So I think that's a big lesson in, in many different ways, not only when you're making a transition. Yeah, um, here's another. That. Yeah. And so, uh, so now we talk about, you mentioned, don't just focus on your direct competitors. And I <laughs> love this because, so this is even on the B2B side, uh, I used to work with a software company and I'd work with the competitive sales office sometimes to, you know, understand what the win loss reports and some of these things. And, you know, I felt it wasn't just the business thing of understanding the win loss. It wasn't just like, okay, what, uh, intelligence, customer intelligence can we glean from that? I felt this real tribalism, you know what I mean? Like anytime we would beat the, the bigger software competition, like, yeah, you know, and any, and, and like, yeah, we're so much better and stuff. And, and I realized kind of that was bubbling up in me when to the customer that didn't matter at all. They didn't, they didn't care about that. But like when you're in market, and, and when you can kind of see your results so clearly, you feel that like you're on this team and it's very difficult. You, you can easily get, you know, blindsided by the competition. So, so tell us, uh, you know, in your career, how that happened. It's actually happened a couple of times. You know, the, the first time that it happened, I was working on the Gatorade brand. Uh, Gatorade was owned by Pepsi. Powerade, its most direct competitor, is owned by Coke. And we had a maniacal focus on Powerade. Um, in the vein of kind of Coke versus Pepsi, Cola Wars, it was the same for Gatorade versus Powerade. We did we had an eighty something share at the time, and we didn't want to lose a you know a point or a tenth of a point of share to Powerade, and we measured it weekly, and it was just very 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 focused, and and we understood why that was the the focus at the time. But but if you go back to you know early to mid two thousands. If, if you wanted something in the grocery store that, that was not a, a, a soft drink, not a carbonated soft drink, that was not milk or juice or water, really the only thing that was available at the time was Gatorade or Powerade. And so as people were leaving the carbonated soft drink business and you know, just, to, just like they do today, consumers are looking for flavor. They're looking for refreshment. So milk, juice, water sort of didn't fulfill that flavorful refreshment type of need state. But they didn't want the calories and they didn't want the, the perception of drinking a, a soft drink. You, you, you were kind of in this world of Gatorade and Powerade. So, you know, in, in that time period, in the mid-2000s, Gatorade was growing 10, 15%. It was really, you know, the three or four years post the Pepsi acquisition and business was good. Everybody was happy. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, we weren't losing share to Powerade, but our business was slowing down. And because the share was measured in the sports drink vertical specifically. So we're wondering, we're sitting here wondering, what's, why are we, why are we slowing down here when we're, it's not power that's taken, taken from us. It's, it's gotta be something else. And you look around and you have all of a sudden you have all of these small ish uh, new brands that are out there, vitamin water, probably being, you know, the most prominent of them at the time and, and probably today. Um, and, and what they were doing, they were, they were stealing the occasions that, Frankly, Gatorade and Powerade didn't really have the right to win. They, it was flavorful refreshment, but at a much lower calorie 
uh, than a Gatorade or a Powerade. And so when consumers are saying, hey, I don't want juice, milk, or, or soft drink, and I, I want some flavor in it, and I don't just want plain water, vitamin water, Sobe, they were certainly positioned to take that, to take that uh, space, and they did. And they grew and they got acquired and, and vitamin water became a, you know, a mega brand. And, you know, Gatorade has certainly responded with different, you know, caloric offerings and different, um, you know, water brand and Propel that was tied to it. So it, it, it was a good lesson of not, you can't always look straight ahead or straight at the, the competitor. You, you've got to look at the environment and specifically you have to look at what the consumer's need states are and how they're being fulfilled. Um, you know, another a couple of times that's happened in my career at Wendy's, I, I was there at the time, really when, you know, we, we called them fast casual uh, restaurants. So like a Panera or a Chipotle, they were really starting to grow. And, you know, our direct competitors at Wendy's were Burger King and McDonald's. You know, we're fighting the burger wars, if, if you will. But what consumers were telling us as they were kind of migrating a little bit towards Chipotle and Panera was hey, I'm willing to pay a little bit more for better quality. I'm willing to pay a little bit more for a better in restaurant experience. I'm willing to pay a little bit more to be treated right by uh, the staff of of those locations. And back back at the origin of Chipotle and Wendy's, uh, or Chipotle and Panera, excuse me, um, that's what what their value proposition was. And so, you know, it actually, in Wendy's case, it worked to our advantage because we always thought, hey, we have actually better quality food um, at fast food prices. And so we tried to play that up in our positioning and we almost took a little bit of a middle ground between, you know, your core fast food, McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, et cetera, and in be, you know, sitting in between the Chipotles and the Panera. So it was fast casual quality, but at fast food prices. And that was really the positioning that, that we took at, at, at Wendy's. And it was a good example of really looking around and seeing what consumers were willing to pay for. And then even most recently at our artisanal brewing ventures, um, you know, craft beer has been growing for 20 years. Um, craft beer is flavorful. It's not, you know, like the Miller Lite, Coors Light, Bud Light, of the world. Um, it's got unique taste to it, it, it and it's got a little bit of a story to it. Um, but then all of a sudden these things called hard seltzers come around and they go from zero to, you know, mega growth um, in a matter of a couple of years. And what were they what occasions were they taking flavor, but less calories sessionable, meaning I can drink them, you know, in multiples versus craft beer where, you know, a lot of them are packed with, you know, pretty high ABV levels. And so they were taking occasions away of, you know, at the beach, at the pool, you know, hanging out with my friends. And, and so craft beer in some ways maybe didn't see that as a perfect substitute, but consumers did. So I, I think, you know, I, you see this at a couple different spots in, in my career. And I just think it's, it's imperative for marketers to, to obsess with your competition, but really you have to over obsess with your consumer and understand, you know, who this consumer is, what are, what's going through their head, what's their buying journey, what's their need states and, and how do you fit in whatever your product or, or service that you're marketing? How, how do you fit into that, to that world and make sure that you're fulfilling those things better than anybody else? Yeah, you know, it kind of reminds me of one of those crime or mystery movies where it's always the one you least expect. You know, you focus <laughs> yeah. on that one. It's always the yeah. one you least expect. But I think you bring up that really good point. And I think it's a very prescient point now, coming out of COVID-19 and these things, how did customer behavior shift? How did customer demand shift? So don't, like you said, don't focus on your competition. Focus on your customer. And that's the way that's you right. learn about your competition. But actually, I want to bring up, you know, you mentioned your three-box approach. I think there's also kind of a three-box approach to competition that can really help us, you know, kind of not overlook things. I published a blog post called Understanding the Three Types of Competitors. Actually, one of the most popular posts we published is quite simple. And so correct me if I'm wrong, because you understand Gatorade better than I do. But uh, so the three types, there's a direct competitor, mm-hmm. right? So for Gatorade, like we said, it's probably Powerade. Uh, there's an indirect competitor. So for Gatorade, that might be vitamin water. But also don't overlook there's a replacement competitor. So for Gatorade, for example, it could be reusable water bottles, right? Mm-hmm. So you could be entirely focused on, I'm going to be Powerade. Now this indirect competitor comes on vitamin water. But when you think about it through the customer perspective, then you think of like, oh, well, shoot, maybe we're competing against a reusable water bottle. And, and how would that change our strategy? And then it might be like, well, Gatorade will sell in, you know, the powder form and you could put it in a reusable water bottle. And, you know, that's how it can help. As you talked about how you position yourself in the marketplace and in the mind of the customer. 
No, I, I love that model. I think it's very, very uh, appropriate. And, you know, there are always going to be substitutes and they're always going to be indirect competitors. And um, so I, I, I love that. Great. So let's talk. So in the first half of the podcast, we talked about some lessons from the things you made. But the other great thing we get to do as marketers is collaborate, work with others, make these things with people and learn from those people. And so the first person that you learned from Todd Magazine, he's currently the CEO of Blink Fitness, but he was the president of the Gatorade division of PepsiCo when you worked there. And he taught you to sweat the details. Very, very fitting for Gatorade, by the way, sweat the details. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so how did, how did uh, Todd teach you that? Well, you know, as I was kind of a, a junior level marketer at, at Gatorade, one of one of my roles or you know, routines that I had to perform on a weekly basis is, you know, tracking the business um, from a business results perspective, reading the, the IRI, Nielsen data, um, the shipments and all of those things, as, as well as managing the marketing budget. And, you know, I got into a pretty smooth routine. It was something we did weekly and monthly. So, you know, I, I, I kind of had it on rails, at least so I, so I thought. And uh, there was a, a meeting at, at one time, just one of these you know, normal weekly meetings. And I had gone through my presentation and I'm about halfway through and there is a, there's a number that's, that's wrong on the page. And so, you know, I was pretty good about that stuff, of, you know, kind of obsessing over, over the details. But um, in this particular instance, uh, Todd uh, stopped the meeting. He knew the, he knew the number was wrong. I was trying to, deflect and position it like it was sort of right even though in my heart of hearts i knew it was wrong too um i just didn't want to be wrong in the meeting so todd stopped the meeting said i i'm we're done with this and moved on to the next person that that had a role in the presentation and you know after afterwards um you know i'm i'm mad because it, you know it's a little embarrassed and also just a little bit of a shame that i kind of missed something but uh you know afterward he, he comes up to me and and uh he said do you know why I stopped the meeting? And I'm like, yeah, I think so. But he, you know, went on to tell me, he's like, you know, when your numbers are wrong, never mind that you tried to defend a wrong number that you know was wrong. How do I trust that anything else was right? Or should I be asking questions about everything else, about your assessment of the business, about where we are on the budget? You know, you have, you're telling us, and it's your role to tell us where we are and what to look at and what's the state of the budget and how should we think about the business? And so when you're wrong, um, I'm going to question everything else that's in the presentation. That's just the nature of a leader. And it was a good lesson, you know, and I'm not saying I haven't made any mistakes since, but uh, you know, I certainly put that lens on as I'm, as I'm looking at presentations or I'm looking at recommendations, I'm saying, okay, where are the holes in this? What, where are the questions going to come from? If I were sitting in, Todd shoes or, you know, a CEO shoes or whomever, a franchisee shoes, where's the, where are the questions going to come from? And do I have the right support in this document or this presentation or whatever it is to be able to support my point of view? And uh, I think it was a, it was a good lesson, a, you know, humbling lesson, but uh, one that, that that's certainly shaped how I think about um, data details, presentations and, and preparation. Yeah, I think, I mean, I learned a few things from that story and things like I think of in my career too. So one of it is, you know, as we talk about taking the customer's perspective and what they're thinking through, anytime you're presenting internally or to a client, also taking their perspective, like you said, you know, kind of stress test that presentation or that report, what kind of questions could they ask? And if you answer those questions before they get there, you're going to have one step up because an old boss used to tell me when we were presenting, I was an advertising copywriter early in my career. And when we would present a concept to a client, he'd always say, we don't even want them to pick up the pencil. Right. Mm -hmm. You want to have all the information right away. He's just like, you know, once they start picking up that pencil, they're not going to stop. And mm -hmm. it gets to your point of like, you know, usually the, the, your, your boss, your business leaders, or even your customers are not going to know about all the information that you're presenting, but they will know about some of it. And when one of those details is wrong, you don't, might not know which one it is. They're going to question everything else. Right. But if they know a thing and then you, you know, kind of what you're saying is accurate, then they're probably more likely to believe everything else you're saying. Uh, but, the, but the other thing, but the other great thing, and what I loved is that, uh, you know, you tried to bluff your way through it because the other great thing <laughs> earlier in my career, you know, I'd come out of college and I'd, going to meetings or in presentations or, you know, on, and I would feel like I had to know everything. It was hard, you know, yes. and so you, you get a client, you get a question in a meeting with a client, you'd be on the spot and you'd kind of answer it and bluff your way through it, even if you didn't know, or, you know, I didn't think I could make any mistakes. And something I've learned, if you're a younger marketer, it's so true. If you're in a meeting or if you're somewhere and you don't know the answer, you're wrong, just fess up to it or even offer to get back. Okay, this seems yeah. wrong. Let me, let me do some more research and I will get back to you versus like you said, I'll just 100%. try to bluff my way through it. 
A hundred percent. You know, it was uh, PepsiCo at the time. And I'm sure it still is. It's a pretty, pretty competitive marketing environment. And, you know, being wrong or showing a little bit of weakness was something I didn't, I, at the time, I didn't have the maturity to do. And, and so I think it's, uh, you're a hundred percent right from a lesson standpoint. You know what, let me, let me think on that one, or let me get back to you, or let me do some research and, and just move on with it. It'll be a much better situation for you in the long run. Well, I think we've all been there. So thanks for sharing. I think we can learn from it. Uh, the next person we're going to talk about and learn from is Debbie Gonzalez. Now she's the SVP of Global Marketing and Communications at Concentrix. And when you worked, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping some, I'm skipping some. We have uh, Craig Boehner, this, uh, currently the CEO of Sarah Lee Frozen Breakery. Uh, he was the CMO of Wendy's when you worked with Craig. And you talked that you uh, learned how to be strategically consistent and tactically agile. So how did you learn that from Craig? Yeah, it's funny. Um if anybody on my current team or former teams uh, since my Wendy's experience are, are listening to this, they're going to laugh because I use this all the time. Um, you know, it, when we, we got to Wendy's, when I got to Wendy's, um, the business wasn't in good shape. It was pretty sick. Um, the menu was a little stale. Uh, they had gone through, you know, many different leaders, uh, many different advertising campaigns. The real estate and the in-store experience was was getting a little dated. And so we knew we had to change and we knew we had to change very rapidly and we had to change everything about the business from the brand identity to the menu, to the marketing communications platform, um, just, you know, everything. And, you know, I mentioned where we kind of netted out, I mentioned earlier where we kind of netted out on the positioning, um, being, you know, fast, casual quality at fast food prices. And so we, we knew strategically where we wanted to go and how we wanted to present the menu and, you know, what we wanted to do from a marketing communication standpoint to, to make it more modern, to make it more relevant to, uh, to a younger consumer. We knew strategically what to do. Um, the problem was, and, you know, the challenge, I guess, was in a franchise environment, you're trying to bring along 6,000 units. They're not all going to be remodeled at the same time. They're not all going to put up new signs at the same time. Um, you know, the marketing communication side of things, it was a brand new advertising campaign. And prior to that campaign, it, there was a saying at Wendy's, it, it, your marketing idea or, or your campaign is, is, is going to be a good one if it was TV or radio or billboards. You know, this is 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. Digital social hadn't really been part of it. And so, you know, as, as we kind of went through this process, we knew we had it to get younger, if you will, in the way that we communicated. We had to be on social. We had to be digital. And yes, we still had to do TV and all of those things, but we knew we had to change perceptions of not just a consumer, but our franchise environment too, our franchisees. So I think the notion of strategically consistent, tactically agile came about because we were confident in where we needed to go and how we needed to get there. If that's, you know, how I think about strategy is how you compete in the market, the, choice, the, the choices that you made, how those strategies were going to be applied were going to be the tactics that, you know, are then portrayed to a consumer. We didn't know exactly what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. We had our intuition, we had our testing process, we had our experience but we still had to convince franchisees and we still had to convince consumers that this brand was changing and it was different. And so it took a, a, a few, you know, I would say many of the things we got right. Some of the things maybe we didn't get as right, but if you look at it in total, you know, that was a pivot point for, for the brand. And I would say that, uh, you know, by and large, it, it was something that moved the Wendy's brand to kind of where it is today, which, which has had really steady growth you know, over the last decade or so. And, but like I said, it, when you look back in history, that pivot point looks pretty positive. The trends, if you look at same source sales, looked great. How we got there, how the sausage was made <laughs> was a little sloppy. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I think that's, that's, you know, the lesson that I took from that is be, you know, do your homework on your vision, do your homework on your positioning, do your homework on your strategies, make sure that those things are super, super sound. But as you apply tactics, you're going to use your experience. You're going to use, you know, testing data, whatever it is. But understand that if, if a tactic's not working, especially in today's world of marketing, when you've got so many numbers and so many you know, data points and analytic uh, minds to, to help you along, it's okay to not get something right. It's okay to have a tactic that doesn't work. Just know that you've got to be agile enough to change quickly. Um, don't waste money doing something that's not working. You know, what can you learn from why it didn't work? 
apply that learning and move to something else and move quickly. And so that was, that was something that, you know, was, was, um, you know, kind of ingrained in, in me and our team through Craig and something that I, I still use today. If you're going to, if you're going to do a tactic and it doesn't work, fail fast, fail forward and do, and apply it to the next thing that you, that you're doing to impact the consumer. Yeah. And I think that's also kind of re- very relevant in the kind of COVID post COVID era we're coming out today where many things have shifted, but what should stay core and stay true to the business? And to me, when I hear you say that, it gets to the difference of what is the core value proposition of the business versus what of the what is the marketing experimentation to communicate that? And uh-huh. Wendy's, you know, when it comes to Wendy's, uh, you know, I always loved how they would say, um, you know, what you know, the Dave Thomas thing, why do we make square burgers? Uh, you know, because we don't cut corners. Cut corners and right. <laughs> as you talked about, yeah, I love that. It was beautiful. And that's, you know, way back in the day. And as you talked about, as the Chipotle's and Panera's were coming up, you realize Wendy's had that right positioning. So it's how to get, you know, that experimentation to get that right messaging out there. So it doesn't necessarily mean you shift the core value proposition of the business, you know, find out what is still true about the business. Yeah. And sometimes in a franchise environment, that's, that's hard because it, the nature of a franchise e franchise or business is you're spending franchisees money and marketing. So, you know, you, you don't, you want every dollar to be working as hard as it can. And, and you'll be, you know, facing questions from franchisees about, you know, how is my money working and, and so on and so forth. And so um, that's why, you know, if we're going to fail, fail small, fail fast, move forward. And that's, that's, uh, that's how the, the mindset is. So I appreciate you being very open to talking about the failing part, but I think that the, the flip side is the success. So if we're if you're testing and you've got that pilot or A/B test or whatever it is, then you've got that proof to show the franchisees or whatever other you know a group you have to convince. Sometimes it's the board of directors, and sometimes it's a client of like you know, okay, this seems kind of scary for you. We're just going to do this small little test, and now look, we've got some data and proof to show this is worth investing more in. Yeah, hundred percent, and certainly over the last ten years or so, that's gotten easier just with the uh, data availability systems that you know weren't available at, at that point in time at Wendy's. But um, absolutely, the concept of that is is spot on, and you know you're able to use data to say you know to make a course correction or to to use data to say no, 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 we got this right. Let's double down here uh, for impact. Great. So let's talk about getting more to kind of the the core of the business. Uh, and you talked about Debbie Gonzalez. Right now, she's the SVP of Global Marketing and Communications at Concentrix, and she was the Chief Brand Officer at Massage Envy. And you talk about understanding the purpose of the business, right? So when Wendy's, we talked about you, you know, kind of clarifying the position of the brand. But what were you doing at Massage Envy with Debbie? What did you learn from her? Yeah, you know, at, at Wendy's, um, we knew where you know quick service food fit into people's lives. They have three meals a day, basically, and seven days a week, you know, more or less, you had 21 occasions to, to potentially impact a a, a customer when they were hungry or when they needed food. At Massage Indy, the challenge was a little bit different. Um, You know, they had entered the, the, this white space world of accessible, um, convenient, affordable massage. And, and it was great. And the business really thrived and grew and, but, you know, as as the white space um, in terms of geographic territory started to close up a little bit and unit uh, store growth started to slow as as with any you know franchise concept that's in rapid growth, what we really had to do was define the business that we're in. Um, we, we didn't want to just be uh, a massage business that was, you know, affordable and accessible and, and whatever. We, at the time, you know, Proactive wellness, taking care of yourself, doing doing things to stay out of the doctor's office was really you know the, the prevailing consumer trend in, in, in healthcare, and so we thought that was a more aspirational and um, you know growth potential space to be in. So what we really had to decide is what is this business all about? Is this business about convenient, affordable massage, or is this can be is this business about you know being part of a proactive you know, wellness or health, healthcare journey. And if, if it's the former, then we have to double down and, and be the best at massage that we could be. But in reality, you know, convenient, affordable massage, when you're not talking about an experience that's at a resort or, you know, at the beach, it's it, your latitude to be better than other, other people is pretty limited. There's not a ton of, 
you know, bells and whistles that you can put on that. So what we really wanted to be was how do we get into the wellness business? How, how can this brand stand for, you know, whatever the, the, the wellness trend of the day is? So it allowed the business to get into the facial, uh, the facial category. It allowed the business to get into, you know, assisted stretching, which you see in other concepts with Stretch Zone and Stretch Lab now. It allowed the business to get into percussion therapy, which is something that's really starting to pop now um, with different athletes. Um, you know, buying into, you know, brands like, like Theragun. Um, so the definition of what business are we in and what's the purpose of this business was at the heart of what, what we had to do and what Debbie was leading at the time when I, when I came on board. And so, you know, the lesson that I kind of take from it is, you know, in, in, in some ways it ties a little bit back to, you know, where are your competitors coming from? It's, you know, what business are we in? What right do we have as a brand or, or as an organization to be in that business? And what are the proof points that we need to put out there as a, either as a brand or as a system in the case of Massage Envy or even a Batteries Plus that we are the right, we have the right to be there and you can believe in us as, as part of that journey. And so that was a, a, a different type of, of brand repositioning experience than what, what Wendy's was, but, you know, something that was, was super impactful and, and frankly, super educational for me. I like the way you say we have the right to be there. You know, why should you be there? So when I read this story, it got me thinking of, uh, we have a free digital marketing course and in session eight, one of the lessons is replace the claim with the reason. You know, and so many times in my marketing career, like on the agency side or whatever, it's easy to get in these meetings and it just, it's all these claims, it's all these claims. And you forget in the meeting, they're like, oh, so we've got, you know, this budget to run this in the time, you know, I was wondering full page ads in the Wall Street Journal, you know, big budgets, get in front of people. It's like, oh, well, so we can, we can say whatever we want in that ad, right? We're paying for it. And you forget like, well, hey, that's a claim. We could say whatever we want. You know, but is anyone going to believe us? Is the customer going to believe us? And so I think, you know, I encourage every marketer, even if you're junior copywriter to the marketing leader, to kind of have that skeptical customer look at every claim that comes up. Because what you did there is you had the actual reason, right? So I love that you were working on a business level and coming up with what is the reason customers should shop with us, customers should buy from us, customers should, you know, get whatever product from us. And then from there, then you get into the proof points. Like you said, you get into the marketing messaging. So whether you're that junior copywriter or that marketing leader, if you're working with an agency, sometimes, you know, you throw on the agency like, oh, come up with a spiffy campaign with us. But first as a marketing leader in that business, what is the reason? What are you working on in the business that then you can message out to the customers? Yeah, and, and how do you develop those those proof points that are really believable? So, like you take uh, Batteries Plus, for instance. You know, we're in the the phone uh, device repair business. Okay, well, your name is Batteries Plus, but you're in you're in the device repair business. So, how do you convey authority and expertise in that space to to a potential customer? And so, you know, we have a partnership with Samsung now to be one of their select providers of their parts. So, OEM parts, um, OEM type training. And so we're qualified through the training and the parts to be an authorized dealer of, of phone repair uh, for Samsung phones. Okay, well, Samsung OEM parts, uh, you know, real high quality training. Now we've got a right to be in that business. And so that, those are the types of things that um, as, you're, as you look at your business and really focusing on that, not just what business are we in, but to your point, um, what's our right to be in this business and how do we win in this business? Yeah, I'm going to repeat those words because I love hearing you saying the right to be in the business. That's a great lesson for all of us. Uh, well, speaking of Batteries Plus, uh, you talked about uh, Scott Williams, the CEO of Batteries Plus, and you got to see up close and learn from him. Leadership requires talent and passion. So how are you learning that from Scott right now? You know, it, it's, he, he's, uh, he's a different type of leader than, than anybody that, I, that I've worked on. I mean, he is as, as calm and measured um, as, as they get. And what I'm, you know, we're going through right now, a, a big transition of our e-commerce engine. So going from a homegrown legacy system to a more contemporary system. And as with any, you know, big transition like this, it, there's been a lot of, of, of things that we've learned along the way. And, you know, I've only been at Batteries Plus for five or six weeks here. And, you know, what Scott has kind of shown me through this is, you know, he's, he's deliberate in the way that he, um, ask his questions and pushes on the team to, to really get to good insights of what's going on. What are we doing next? What resources do we need? And so on. Um, but, you know, he is in 
as you can imagine, when you're going through this, it's kind of all hands on deck, trying to make sure you're getting your sessions up and your conversion rate to back to where it needs to be. And he's, um, he keeps a sense of discipline and, and a sense of push on the team, but also an incredible sense of calm in the way that he deals with, you know, a pretty, a pretty big initiative um, that's, that's key to the future success of the company. So, you know, I'm looking at him saying, man, my hair is on fire here after four or five weeks trying to get this thing right. And you seem really, really calm. And I know that you're not, but um, you know, it's just been a, it's been a good lesson for me and just kind of uh, how to, demonstrate leadership and in, in really kind of tough and, and pressure cooker types of situations. I mean, I think that's great. You know, being a leader, not just kind of communicating things, but showing also too, by your own Shut behavior, up. leadership, taking that discipline mixed with the calm. I know here with our own, I'll just give a quick shout out to our own CEO, Flint McLaughlin. He always teaches kind of humility because we're big on experimentation. And so he published a blog post out to the world with his, the five greatest mistakes he's made as a leader. So I think it's one thing to say, hey, you should be humble. It's another thing to say to the world, here are the mistakes I've made, right? It's, a one, it's one thing to say, hey, we need to be disciplined but calm. It's another thing to see that in action. Um, yeah, it's, he's, uh, he, you know, Scott's a very, very humble but yet very accomplished leader. If you look at back at, at what he's done uh, across his career um, and, and, you know, having worked for him for, you know, five or six weeks, I can see why he's been successful. I can see why people follow him. I can see why people have followed him from prior, uh, you know, prior experiences to come work for him again at, at, at Batteries Plus. And, and so I think we have a, an amazing leadership team that, that Scott has assembled um, that has, you know, legacy knowledge of the Batteries Plus uh, system and business. Um, and, but also knowledge of, of, from people that have come in from other categories, from other types of businesses, franchise businesses, non-franchise businesses. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I have, I'm very impressed with what I'm seeing from this team again, you know, five or six weeks in, but the type of thinking, the type of experience, the type of demeanor and leadership that, that this team is showing is, is truly remarkable. Well, those are some great. Uh, qualities of a, a good leader, deep knowledge, discipline, calm, humility. Let's talk about, let's, let's leave people with this. What are the key qualities of an effective marketer? That's a great question. Um, I, the one I always put at the top of the list is empathy. Um, empathy for the consumer, um, empathy of understanding, you know, the consumer's need states, buying cycle, you know, what they need from your brand, um, really putting yourself in their shoes is, is, is very, very critical to being successful as a marketer. I think second is um, you have to have this kind of innate balance between creativity and analytic ability, um, which is you know, what I find very fun about marketing and something that's you know challenging on a, on a day-to-day basis. You're going from a meeting about business results and numbers to a creative meeting, um, trying to understand, you know, is this, is this piece of art, whatever it is, conveying the right message to a, to a consumer. So, you know, having that, that balance of creativity and, and analytic ability is, is a key to success in marketing. And then finally, I think in every one of these roles that we've talked about today and in different ways, marketing as a, as a function is at the kind of center of a lot of things. Um, it's at the center of, you know, creating vision. We've talked about that the center of positioning, the center of, you know, understanding the business from a, from a numerical standpoint, an analytic standpoint at the center of product development, communication, and those things impact everybody in the organization. And so you find yourself in cross-functional environments. Quite often you find yourself being looked to, uh, to lead in a lot of different ways, whether you're a junior marketer, mid-level marketer, or senior marketer. So I would say leadership, and the ability to, to instill confidence in, in, in your vision as a marketer and be able to uh, really support that through um, your connections and communications across the organization is, is uh, the third you know, criteria for a great marketer. I want to really emphasize that last point because when marketing gets a bad rap within an organization, it's a cost sink, it's a cost center, right? Mm-hmm. But really, it should be helping drive the business strategy forward, right? That's what marketers should be doing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's... You know, we, our job is to create consumer demand. It's it's to create pull, and without you know good effective marketing, you know from all disciplines of marketing, um, you know obviously I'm biased, but uh, you know if we're not creating demand, we're not selling anything. 
And so, you know, we've, we've got to do our job and, and not be really viewed as a cost center, but, uh, you know, being viewed as uh, you know, a, a, a department that is changing the perception of your brand so that you can influence the behavior that you want from your consumers and ultimately deliver you know, demand creation and, and consumer pull and ultimately sales. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your stories and lessons, Derek. I think we all learned something to do our job better. I appreciate you having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, fun for me too, and hopefully fun for everyone who is listening. So thanks a lot for tuning in today, folks. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com. Thank you.